what about the differences between the Cartesian view and the views of other substance dualists, such as Leibniz and Malbon, in connection with psychophysical correlations, correlations that is between mental changes and physical changes. For example, why is it that mental events and physical events are correlated in systematic ways? In the case of human beings, that's the question. I decide to sit down, and then what happens next? I sit down. I take an Advil for my headache, and pretty soon the headache is gone. That's what I mean by psychophysical correlations. Correlations between mental changes and physical changes in the body. What explains uh, these things? What will be Descartes' answer here? It's fairly straightforward, since Descartes <coughs> is an interactionist, somebody who believes that there's two-way causal interaction between the mind and the body. He would say, it's my decision to sit down that causes me to sit down via some relevant brain event. And that's the intermediary here. Uh, and it's um, the changes that the admiral does to my brain which cause the change in mental state. My headache <coughs> is gone. It's causation. That's the explanation given by an interactionist. Later substance dualists, such as Leibniz and Malpons, who rejected interactionism because they didn't think it was possible to harmonize substance dualism and interactionism, came up with different explanations. They're not exactly plausible, convincing, right? But it's important to pay attention to them because that tells you a little bit about how impressed they were with this difficulty, the difficulty that Cartesian dualism runs into, namely Descartes' attempt to defend both substance dualism and interactionism at the same time. Why is it that right after I decide to sit down, I sit down? for lightness, for example. It's not because the mind causes any change in the body, no causation, both arrows are crossed out. Rather, it's because they were created by God at the beginning in a special way, right? Just as uh, the clock manufacturer created the clocks from the very beginning in a special way to make sure that they always show the same time. When God created the mind and the body, he created them so that their histories would always mirror each other, so that changes in the one substance would always be mirrored by corresponding changes in the other substance. Yes? That just kind of feels like whenever a kid, like when a kid doesn't understand the answer to a question on the test, just puts Jesus as the answer. That feels like the equivalent. Yeah, right. Okay. Except that this was in the 17th century, the beginning of the 18th century, right? It's a move that's understandable for that time, and um, it's also ingenious. It may not have psychological plausibility, scientific plausibility, but it's an ingenious move. Right? It's got to do with how the two substances were created at the beginning. Um, why is it, again, that after deciding to sit down, I sit down according to my thought? Well, God notices the change in the, in the mind in this case, namely that a decision arises, the decision to sit down, and then he intervenes and causes the corresponding change in the body, corresponding physical change. It's always divine intervention. Dualists have always had trouble accommodating interactionism into their view. We've seen that for substance dualism, there are reasons that explain why property dualists have a similar problem. Property dualists sometimes feel compelled to reject interactionism too. And Jackson is a case in point. That's the epiphenomenalism half of his essay. I'm not going to say too much about that. But I want to define the term and explain a little bit in what sense quality are supposed to be epiphenomenal for him, for Jackson. So we moved on to the 1982 essay by Frank Jackson titled Epiphenomenal Quality. Let me pull that up. What's that? Ah. by the brain, they're caused by the physical events occurring in the brain, but they lack physical effects, according to Jackson. So looking again at the two arrows connecting the 
mind and the body from the previous picture, right? Jackson wouldn't cross out both arrows, just one of them. He would keep the arrow from the body to the mind. His conscious states are the result of physical processes happening in the brain, but he would cross out the arrow from the mind to the body because he thinks that mental states lack causal efficacy. They can't cause anything physical. They are, in that sense, epiphenomena. What does the word epiphenomenon in the singular and the epiphenomena in the plural mean? An epiphenomenon is a byproduct of something else that's not causally efficacious. It's causally impotent. So consciousness, it's caused by physical occurrences happening in the brain. Right? It's the result of those physical neurophysiological processes, if you will. But it lacks physical effects. It can't affect in any way what happens to the body, what the body does. It's a little bit like the shadow that objects cast on the ground. The shadow follows them everywhere. Right? It's a result of what the body does, but it can't really affect the body in any way. Or like the steam coming out of the locomotive. The steam accompanies the locomotive, and it's the result of the, the physical processes inside the locomotive, but can't affect the motion of the locomotive in any way. That's how Jackson thinks about the mind, and consciousness in particular. Conscious states can't cause anything physical, which entails they can't cause behavior. It's not because of your decision to sit down that, that you sit down. It's because of something else. What reasons he has to embrace epiphenomenalism is a complex question. He answers that in the second half of the paper. And this is a topic that we discuss, for example, in the metaphysics course and the contemporary philosophy course, advanced philosophy courses. In this class, we want to concentrate on what he does in the first half of his essay, namely his argument for prophecy dualism and against physicalism. So remember this taxonomy of solutions to the mind-body problem. Monism, which these days means essentially materialism or physicalism, right? Idealism is not very popular any longer. It's never been extremely popular, but these days it's very hard to find philosophers defending idealism, so physicalism essentially on the one hand, and then dualism. Dualism, which is of two kinds, the stronger, historically first type, substance dualism, and the weaker, more recent form, property dualism. The physicalist claims that there's only one kind of object in the world, physical objects or bodies, and these objects have only one type of properties, physical properties. Everything is physical, or entities are physical, or properties or attributes <coughs> are physical. A substance dualist posits a duality of types of things, two types of things. Physical things or bodies, and non-physical things or souls. The property dualist is not comfortable in talking about immaterial souls. Jackson, I told you, is a property dualist. He doesn't believe in immaterial souls. All there is to you as a person, according to him, is the body. You have a body and the brain. No non-physical anything in the sense of a non-physical substance or thing, entity. No non-physical entity. But the body, the brain specifically, has two kinds of attributes. It is in two kinds of states. Physical attributes and mental attributes. Things like believing, desiring, perceiving, feeling, pleasure, pain, jealousy, etc. The mental attributes and states not being explainable in physical terms. You need to posit both of these. The physical ones and the mental ones in addition to the physical, which are understood as non-physical. Right? Believing, desiring, feeling, perceiving, these are non-physical properties of the physical brain. These are the views, and um, the central argument in the paper is called the knowledge argument. It's an argument directed against physicalism and designed to support property dualism. The conclusion of the argument is consciousness or qualia can't be physical. They are non-physical properties of the brain. Physicalism gets rejected, property dualism gets endorsed. What's the gist of the knowledge argument? It's fairly simple, very easy to explain. And you can't quite
quite leave it at that, because from a rhetorical perspective, it doesn't seem very powerful. You need to back it up with other things, with a couple of thought experiments. So the gist of the argument, no matter how many physical details you might know about the body in the brain, that's not going to give you any insight whatsoever into the nature of consciousness. It's not going to tell you anything, no matter how much physical information you might have about the body and the brain and <coughs> behavior and so on, that's not going to tell you anything about the way that it's like to smell freshly ground coffee, or the way that it's like to taste lemon juice, or the way that it's like to feel um, pain, or the way that it's like to feel jealousy. It's not going to tell you anything about the nature of quality the nature of conscious experience. Conclusion, qualia, consciousness, can't be physical. Because if they were physical, you should have been able to learn everything about them just by studying the physical properties of the body. That's it. That's the knowledge argument, in essence. But if you leave it at that, you're unlikely to persuade physicalists to reject their view and switch camps. Which is why it helps if you can couple the argument with some thought experiments. That's exactly what Jackson does in his paper. There are two thought experiments he introduces. <coughs> thought experiments intended to elicit very strong intuitions. Uh, the one about Fred, the scenario about Fred, and the scenario about Mary, the brilliant neuroscientist. They're intended to do the same job. Very similar in structure, you would think either both succeed or both fail, depending on your perspective, your evaluation um, of these scenarios. For some reason, in the literature, one of them is extremely famous. Not the first one, not the one about Fred, the other one, about Mary. But they're very, very similar. Maybe rhetorically, the second one seems more interesting, but Otherwise, philosophically, they come down to the same thing. How about Fred? Let's discuss the Fred story first. What's so noteworthy about Fred that he deserves mention in a philosophy paper? He's a fictional character, of course. Not a real life person, but what do you remember about him? Right, that's right. He claims that he can tell the difference between two shades of red, which to everybody also look the same. He's given a bunch of tomatoes, he sorts them out immediately into the so-called red one tomatoes and the so-called red two tomatoes. Everybody else looks at them, sees the same thing. And he even has these different words that he's introduced into his idiolect for the two shades of red in question, red one and red two a great deal of imagination about the use of subscripts. Red one and red two. At the beginning, the whole thing looks like a line. Right? Everybody else looks at the tomatoes and they see the same color. It turns out after experiments are conducted that red isn't lying. It's telling the truth. What sorts of experiments are these? At first, they of course um, mix the tomato mix the tomato uh, back together and gave them to him again to see whether he's consistent in his classification. And interestingly enough, he was. Right? He classified them in the exact same way, no matter how many times the experiment was repeated. Then they studied his optical system, and it turned out that there was something different about his retina, different from what we have. Maybe he had more uh, cone cells of different kinds or whatever. And this difference indeed enabled him to distinguish between two different wavelengths that are part of the red spectrum. He was applying, he really saw different things. He was right when he claimed that red one and red two looked to him as different as, say, blue and green tend to look to normal perceivers. It's important to think about the whole story from the perspective of one of these neuroscientists who studied Fred's optical system in great detail. Let's assume that this person reached a point 
where he already knew everything physical there was to know about Fred's color experiences. Already knew all about the neurophysiological processes, the physical processes happening in Fred's body, as well as about his behavior in response to seeing red one and red two. So this neuroscientist was very curious, in, in spite of this extensive physical knowledge, was very curious about how it felt for Fred to see red one and red two. He said to himself, well, I wish I were able to see these colors myself, to see exactly what it's like to perceive red one and what it's like to perceive red two. Luckily, Fred donated his body to science, and after his death, the neuroscientists transplanted his optical system into the body of the curious neuroscientist. Upon waking up, the neuroscientist, of course, requested a bunch of tomatoes. And sure enough, now he could see the difference between the red one tomatoes and the red two tomatoes. What's the most plausible ending to the story? Jackson expects you to say something like this. The neuroscientist was very surprised and excited about what he learned upon waking up after the surgery. And in spite of his complete physical knowledge about those processes, he learned something new. He finally learned what it was like for Fred to see red one, and also what it was like for Fred to see red two. That's the intuition we tend to have. Um, he had been very curious about the nature of these experiences, and then his curiosity was satisfied. He finally experienced the colors for himself. How do we turn this into an argument? That's at the bottom of the slide. Well, complete physical information about Fred is not complete information about him, period. Complete information simpliciter. Complete information about Fred's body, brain, optical system, behavior, etc., leaves something out. What does it leave out? Well, the way that it's like for Fred to see red one, the, the new colors, and the way that it's like for Fred to see red two. Namely, what it leaves out is qualia, the qualia characterizing these two experiences. Therefore, those qualia, color qualia in general, and Jackson would be willing to extrapolate to all qualia, can't be physical, because if they were physical, we should be able to learn everything about them just by studying the body and the brain. The conclusion is property dualism. Consciousness is not a physical phenomenon. Qualia are not physical properties. They are non-physical properties of the brain. Why is that? Because if they were physical, you wouldn't need to have the experience to learn these things about them. You should be able to learn all about them just by studying the physical properties of the body. Okay, any reaction to this, or would you rather hear first the other thought experiment and then describe your reaction? Questions, clarificatory questions, for example? Questions are always welcome. Questions, comments? objections, whatever is on your mind. Second thought experiment, I want to start with a three minute TED talk, um, characterizing this and then I'm going to present it again myself. It's a story about Mary, the brilliant neuroscientist, which you're not here anymore for some reason. This trip to get gas for a penny is going to get banned in the U.S. This ex-programmer got fired from his job. Imagine a brilliant neuroscientist named Mary. Mary lives in a black and white room. She only reads black and white books, and her screens only display black and white. But even though she has never seen color, Mary is an expert in colored vision and knows everything ever discovered about its physics and biology. She knows how different wavelengths of light stimulate three types of cone cells in the retina, 
and she knows how electrical signals travel down the optic nerve into the brain. There, they create patterns of neural activity that correspond to the millions of colors most humans can distinguish. Now imagine that one day Mary's black and white screen malfunctions and an apple appears in color. For the first time, she can experience something that she's known about for years. Does she learn anything new? Is there anything about perceiving color that wasn't captured in all her knowledge? Philosopher Frank Jackson proposed this thought experiment called Mary's Room in 1982. He argued that if Mary already knew all the physical facts about color vision and experiencing color still teaches her something new, then mental states like color perception can't be completely described by physical facts. The Mary's Room thought experiment describes what philosophers call the knowledge argument, that there are non-physical properties and knowledge which can only be discovered through conscious experience. The knowledge argument contradicts the theory of physicalism, which says that everything, including mental states, has a physical explanation. To most people hearing Mary's story, it seems intuitively obvious that actually seeing color will be totally different than learning about it. Therefore, there must be some quality of color vision that transcends its physical description. The knowledge argument isn't just about color vision. Mary's room uses color vision to represent conscious experience. If physical science can't entirely explain color vision, then maybe it can't entirely explain other conscious experiences either. For instance, we could know every physical detail about the structure and function of someone else's brain, but still not understand what it feels like to be that person. These ineffable experiences have properties called qualia, subjective qualities that you can't accurately describe or measure. Qualia are unique to the person experiencing them, like having an itch, being in love, or feeling bored. Physical facts can't completely explain mental states like this. Philosophers interested in artificial intelligence have used the knowledge argument to theorize that recreating a physical state won't necessarily recreate a corresponding mental state. In other words, building a computer which mimicked the function of every single neuron of the human brain won't necessarily create a conscious computerized brain. Not all philosophers agree that the Mary's Room experiment is useful. Some argue that her extensive knowledge of color vision would have allowed her to create the same mental state produced by actually seeing the color. The screen malfunction wouldn't show her anything new. Others say that her knowledge was never complete in the first place because it was based only on those physical facts that can be conveyed in words. Years after he proposed it, Jackson actually reversed his own stance on his thought experiment. He decided that even Mary's experience of seeing red still does correspond to a measurable physical event in the brain, not unknowable qualia beyond physical explanation. But there still isn't a definitive answer to the question of whether Mary would learn anything new when she sees the apple. Could it be that there are fundamental limits to what we can know about something we can't experience? And would this mean that there are certain aspects of the universe that lie permanently beyond our comprehension? Or will science and philosophy allow us to overcome our mind's limitations? someone maybe tell you, hey, try to imagine a new color or like try to picture a 4D shape or something like weird like that? 
It's like you can't comprehend it un unless you were to actually see it. Right, so your intuition is kind of in line with the thought experiment. If you've never experienced it, it's very hard to imagine, let alone know ahead of time what it would be like to experience something like that. Right, so going back to the story, let me just um, finish characterizing the events occurring in this narrative. She spent all her life, say 30 years, in the black and white room, and we can assume she has at this point to learn she knows at this point all that there is to know about the physical aspects of color perception. She would be able to talk about it for days on end. She knows everything about how different wavelengths of light stimulate the photoreceptor cells in the retina. And how that generates electrochemical impulses, which are transmitted to the brain via the optic nerve. And then all about what happens in the brain, how that information is processed in the brain exactly. She knows everything about the neurophysiology of color vision. One day, what happens? One day she is released into the world and gets to see for the first time the blue sky and the green grass, as well as some red tomatoes. We can easily imagine her exclaim at this point, oh, how interesting. I've just learned something new. In spite of all the physical information that I already possessed in the room about the brain and the body and people's behavior in response to color experiences, I have just learned something new. I've learned what it's like to see these colors, what it was probably like for normal perceivers to see them, what's been like for normal perceivers to see them all along, even while I was in the room. That's a natural ending to the story. When she finally sees the colors, she learns something new. In spite of her already knowing everything physical there is to know about color perception. What's the underlying argument? Well, it's very similar to what we had before based on the first story. You need complete physical information about color vision leaves something out. What does it leave out? It leaves out quality. The way that it's like to see green which is different from the way that it's like to see red or blue or yellow or any of the other colors. Quali are left out by the complete physical story. Therefore, conclusion, color quali and qualia more generally can't be physical. If they were physical, you should be able to know all about them just by studying the body and the brain. Conclusion of the argument is again property dualism about touch, the rejection. Okay, what are your thoughts on this? Let's try to cause trouble for Jackson to come up with criticisms, which can range from commonsensical, kind of perhaps not terribly philosophically insightful, to more serious criticisms that do carry quite a bit of weight. What are some objections that come to mind? If you think about the plausibility of the story, first of all, she's been kept in a black and white room for 30 years. These are the only experiences she's been allowed to have. Is that easy to picture or kind of difficult when you think about the details? How about her own body, right? How about the food that she's eating? Does that mean black, white, and gray as well? I mean, it could be that this is a stage where people can survive on black and white pills and some black or white or gray liquid instead of water, right? But um, not particularly plausible when you look at the details. Can we fix this problem for Jackson? Is this a serious philosophical objection, or can it be easily fixed? A way of reimagining the story that doesn't involve these impossibilities. So we don't need to paint her skin either black or white and um, you know, give her fills instead of food. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. Other ways of telling the story that would get around this problem. Of like what the little minor details of like the color of her skin and stuff like that? Is there anything to that? When you talk, like, when you say problems, do you mean, like, the, like, minor details of, like, you know, food and, like, the color of their skin and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Oh, you could just remove the co you could just remove the color tones from her eyes. Right. So there could be surgery at the beginning, right after she's born, right to prevent her from seeing, from perceiving the other colors. She's only able to see white, black, and gray. And then it would be a reversal, right? Another surgery thirty years later that enables her to have normal vision, or she could have lenses installed, lenses placed inside her eyes at birth, which are then removed a couple of decades later, something like that. So these are not serious objections. What else can you come up with? Do you agree that upon leaving the room, she learned something new? There's something about qualia that she couldn't have already known. However much physical information she was in possession of while in the room. Well, I'll, I'll just say, like, yeah, this, she had to have learned something new because seeing something like color, that's like, I think it was already mentioned before, but it was like, it's just an experience. Like, you don't just, like, you don't hear about the color red and then, like, try to picture it in your head without knowing, without ever knowing about it. You have to, like, you have to actually see it in order to, like, understand it. Yes, that certainly holds for subjects like us, right, just to play the devil's advocate for a second, but Mary is very different from us in an important respect. There are lots of videos online, right, the people who can't see certain colors have uh, certain perceptual deficiencies, then they undergo surgery and become able to perceive those things, and you can see them cry, they're very happy, very surprised, etc. Why is that unlike the case of Mary? Why is it that such scenarios can't quite be used to support Jackson's argument? How is Mary different, both from these people and from us? Control. What is control? The environment. What she said about um, Yeah, although as you said, the reason why the, the subject's perception is so impoverished doesn't matter a great deal. Like, are they locked inside a black and white room, or has somebody messed up with their visual system at birth? The details don't matter. Mary knows everything physical there is to know about the underlying process, right? The person in the video or you and I don't have that knowledge. Could it be that to somebody who knows everything physical about color and vision, having the experiences wouldn't come as a surprise? Are you inclined to object along those lines? It's important to have a dialogue. Uh, WASP is an activity, as I told you at the beginning of the semester. You're here not just to learn about famous people and their views and arguments. You need to learn how to do philosophy. You can only learn that by doing it, just as you can learn how to write a bike by trying to do it over and over again. Constructing arguments, responding to objections, Raising further objections. That's what philosophy is all about. It's a great workout for the brain. There's another story somewhat similar to this, and it might be useful to compare the marital experiment with this other scenario. It's a scenario discussed by David Hume, an 18th century philosopher. It's called The Missing Shade of Blue. This time, the subject has had access to the entire color spectrum except for one specific shade of blue. Suppose that they're shown in the end an object painted in that color. Do you think they'd be likewise surprised or would such a subject be able to work it out ahead of time based on all the information they have about the color spectrum? It's the shade that's related to the neighboring ones, maybe just as this shade of green is related to the neighboring ones. Right? There's a lot of structural, functional information about the color spectrum that such a person would have even before seeing the missing shade. Could they work it out, work out how the missing shade looks based on all the information they have about the rest of the spectrum? Especially to also give them all the physical information about the brain. The brain states correlated to these color experiences. In other words, do you think there is a reason why Mary's color experience is so impoverished in this scenario? Just black, white, and gray. That's it. Rather than the whole color wheel 
except for one shape? Or do you think the thought experiment would have been equally successful, even if it had been presented um, along the lines of the missing shape? Does the question make sense to you? Or is the intuition much stronger in the case of Mary? Precisely because she's missing all of these colors. She's never seen any of them. Well, can you think about analogous arguments and thought experiments concerning sound? Why does Jackson focus on vision rather than talking about sound? Well, with like sound, part of the issue is like, like think about it. We got language, right? We have language. We're taught the alphabet. You know, R goes R, A goes A. You know, things like that. So if you can put different, you can put different configurations of letters together, and you can make, you could arguably make all the different sounds that you make. But with color, there isn't really a system. Like, yeah, you can spell colors out, but like, you can't really. Right. Visual input is just, I think, by nature, just has different quality up from sound input. Yeah, of course it's they the have only different way I could quality, it. right? But you could um, mess up with her auditory system and prevent her from hearing, right, um, a certain sound. Give her I mean, either a specific sound or a whole bunch of them. Like, you could run a similar thought experiment concerning sound. Um, and the question is, would it be equally convincing or not? How about the missing shade of blue? Do you think it's important that she's only seen black, white, and gray? That makes it very hard, much harder to argue that she would still be able to imagine the colors and figure out which is which, know what, they, what it feels to see them ahead of time. Experiencing them. Okay, no more thoughts for now. I will give you some time to ponder over it. Let me introduce an objection and see what you think about it. One thing that physicalists have said in response to the knowledge, one of the possible moves made uh, by physicalists when trying to attack the knowledge argument. Remember, there are three kinds of knowledge, not just one. And it helps to specify what kind of knowledge Mary acquires when leaving the room. What type of knowledge is that? Is it prepositional or factual knowledge? Is it acquaintance knowledge? Is it skill knowledge? Or is it maybe a combination of some of these or all of them? Remember the difference between all of these kinds of knowledge? Prepositional or factual knowledge. Knowledge is that. This is always attributed by using that clause. I know that Smetana was a Czech composer. I know that Mozart died in 1791. I know that Jackson later changed his mind, or is not famous for his turning physicalist later in his life, or his famous for is his earlier argument against physicalism. I know that these facts obtain. Then there's skill knowledge. I know how to drive a car. I know how to swim. And there's also acquaintance knowledge, knowing a person, a city, uh, experiential knowledge, you could also call it. And then you see the relevance to the present context. If when leaving the room, Mary acquires experiential knowledge about colors. She has the experiences herself. Final. Three different kinds of knowledge. How does that bear on the validity of the knowledge argument? Think about the structure of the knowledge argument. It starts from premises about Mary learning something new, premises about there being new knowledge, and it draws from that a conclusion about the existence of new properties, new qualities, and facts. That's the structure of the argument, essentially. Premises about her learning something new, trying to learn something new means to acquire new knowledge. And a conclusion, so they think that quality are non-physical, there are new attributes, 
new facts, namely properties or attributes of facts that weren't covered by the complete physical story concerning color perception. New facts, this kind of thing. For the argument to go through, the kind of knowledge that Mary acquires after leaving the room must be factual or propositional. If it's just experiential knowledge, if it's just skill knowledge or a combination of the two, the conclusion simply doesn't follow logically from the premise. And some physicalists have argued precisely that. When Mary sees red, blue, green, etc., for the first time, what does she learn? What kind of knowledge is that? The knowledge that she acquires when seeing these colors. Well, it's skill knowledge, first of all, and also experiential or acquaintance knowledge. What are the skills that she acquires? The ability, for example, to recognize the colors now that she has seen them. The ability to imagine seeing red, green, blue, etc. now that she has seen them herself. The ability to remember what it's like to see these things. That's just a cluster of abilities. That doesn't give us new properties and facts. And also, by becoming acquainted with the experiences, she acquires experiential knowledge. But that's not propositional or factual in character either. And so one possible move available to physicalists here is to insist that the new knowledge she acquires after leaving the room is just a combination of acquaintance and school knowledge. No new factual knowledge. Therefore, the metaphysical conclusion about there being non-physical facts and properties just doesn't follow from the facts. How much convincing is such a response? What do you all think? Can't we give examples of new factual knowledge that is only available to Mary after leaving the room that she wasn't in possession of prior to that? Here's an example. Of course, there's also factual knowledge. What are you? learns about when she's released into the world. She sees red tomatoes for the first time and she exclaims, oh, so this is what it's been like all along for normal perceivers to see red tomatoes. I now know that seeing red feels like this. I know that seeing red feels like something? this. Oh, no, this is a You're that clause. And that's propositional or factual knowledge. Knowledge about how it's always been like to see these things for other people. Okay, this looks like a refutation of the physicalist response according to which there's no new factual knowledge acquired by Mary when she sees the colors. Any questions about this? Reactions, comments, anything like that? Another criticism that has to do likewise with the structure of the argument that the argument appears to be invalid for reasons that are fairly similar to the reasons we went over when analyzing Descartes' epistemic argument. Remember I told you, bear that in mind, the Cartesian argument centered on knowledge uh, when reading Jackson, when reading about Jackson's knowledge argument. Because if the Cartesian argument is vulnerable to certain objections, chances are this is going to be vulnerable to similar objections too. Let's imagine the conversation between Jackson and the physicalist in more detail. What are they disagreeing with? What kinds of claims does the physicalist make and what is Jackson's reaction to that? The physicalist, again, is somebody who believes everything about us is physical. We're physical beings, fully physical, and the only properties that we have, that our brain has, are physical properties. For example, a physicalist would say seeing red, that experience, that's just a matter of having um, a spiking frequency of 80 hertz or 50 hertz in the gamma net. Seeing red is identical to that. The subjective qualitative what its likeness of seeing red is identical to this physical property, having a spiking frequency of 50 hertz in the gamma net. Let's assume that the physicalist makes such an identity claim. The mind is physical, <coughs> mental states are physical. Here's an example. This color experience is identical to such and such a 
comes to such and such a physical state of the brain. How do we formulate the knowledge argument as a response to the criticism that the physicalists propose? Well, they can't be one and the same thing, Jackson would argue. Why is that? Because the spiking frequency of 50 hertz in the gamma network is known by Mary to occur when people see red, even when she's in the room. She knows that when people see red, that's what happens in their brain. But the qualitative what it's likeness of seeing red is not known by her to occur in normal perceivers when seeing red. That's something she learns about only after leaving the room once she has the color experiences herself. So one of them is known by her to be present when people look at the color red. The other one is not known by her to be present when the same thing happens. We're talking about her epistemic state while in the room. This is what she knows and doesn't know as long as she's confined to the black and white room. Therefore, Jackson appears to conclude, the sensation of red and having a spiking frequency of 50 hertz in the gamma network can't be identical. It can't be one and the same thing, because one of them is known by Mary to be present under such and such circumstances, but the other one is not known by her to be present under the same circumstances. Does that follow logic? Are you sure? Yeah. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Does the conclusion follow logic from the premises? What is the second argument then? supposed to do on the slide. Remember the counterexample method? You take somebody's argument, you isolate the logical form, ignoring the details, the, the content, and then you create your own argument following the same structure and making sure you have a specific combination of true facts in your own argument. Obviously true premises, indisputably true premises, in an indisputably false conclusion to show that the structure of the argument is flawed. And the problem is that if you state the knowledge argument like that, applying it to this example, we can offer a counterexample. Pick any two terms that co-refer and the subject who's not aware of that. Any two terms that refer to the same entity and a subject who doesn't realize that that is the case. I have here the morning star and the evening star, my example. You can also use Bob Dylan and Robert Zimmerman or Mark Twain and Samuel Clemens or whatever. Two co-referring terms. And the subject who's not aware that they pick out the same entity. The premise one, the morning star is known by Mary or known to Mary to be visible in the morning sky, in that particular spot in the morning sky. That can very well be true. But the evening star is not known to Mary to be visible in the morning sky, in that spot in the morning sky, because she doesn't realize that they're one in the same planet, namely the planet Venus. Does it follow logically that the evening star is distinct from the morning star? No. True premises, if you pick the right Mary, the right subject, and there's somebody ignorant of this identity, and indisputably false conclusion, because actually the evening star is identical to the morning star. And they're identical both to the evening star. What do we make of this? In that all there is to the knowledge argument, namely what you have at the top of the slide, it doesn't look like a valid argument. We can construct a similarly structured argument with also premises from the false conclusion. The physicalist would argue, in other words, that the spiking frequency of 50 hertz in the gamma network and the color qualia instantiated by red experiences are actually one and the same thing, one and the same property, just as the evening star is one and the same thing as the morning star. It's just that this thing is conceptualized in two different ways, or it's thought about under two different modes of presentation as the star visible in the morning sky on the one hand, and the star visible um, in the evening sky, right, on the other hand. Or as such and such a physical property, and such and such a qualitative property, the quality of what it's likeness of seeing red. But the physicalist would insist that they're actually one and the same thing. And when Mary leaves the room, the only major change that occurs is she acquires new concepts. 
new ways of conceptualizing that old property, which you already knew about in the root, so namely the spike and frequency of the in the gamma in this example. Same property, two different conceptualizations of it, two different ways of thinking about it, right? From the fact that she knows about it, she knows that certain things are true about it under one load of presentation, but not under the other, it doesn't follow that we're dealing with two different properties or states. The property and state is the same. It's just thought about in two different ways. When you um, think in terms of a feeling of pain, and when you think in terms of there being C fiber firing in your body, what you're actually thinking about is the same thing. It's a physical property of your body. But that is conceptualized in two different ways. So according to this um, defense of physicalism, the gap between consciousness and the physical is merely conceptual. It has to do merely with how you think about certain states of your body. It's not metaphysical. Consciousness doesn't need to be posited as something over and above the physical properties of the brain. It's just um, a matter of thinking about the very same physical properties under a different mode of presentation. One which you can only acquire by having the experience yourself. You can only think about an experience of red um, under the conceptual mode of presentation if you, um, you can only think about the experience of red under the phenomenal, I should, say, I should have said, mode of presentation if you've had the experience yourself. It's only then that you understand it as a quality. But in fact, the quality is identical to a physical property. Something to think about. So some physicalists deny that there's new factual knowledge or new propositional knowledge. Others grant that there's new propositional knowledge. But they claim it's new knowledge of an old fact, an old physical fact, which becomes known to Mary under a new mode of presentation because of the new concepts that she acquires after reading. How are we doing? Great, thank you for the feedback. Here's a little exercise for you to think about. Uh, this is from Daniel Dennett. Daniel Dennett is a physicalist, another important 20th and 21st century philosopher. He disagrees with Jackson and proposes an alternate ending. He doesn't think that the ending to the, the, the Mary Paul experiment is that we find in Jackson's paper is convincing. Actually, he thinks Mary wouldn't be surprised by what she learns uh, when leaving the room, and that we have no evidence here to back up propositionalism. One thing Mary's captors decided it was time for her to see colors. As a trick, they prepared a bright blue banana to present as her first color experience ever. Mary took one look at it and said, hey, you tr tried to trick me. Bananas are yellow, but this one's blue. Her captures were dumbfounded. How did she do it? Simple, she replied. You have to remember that I know everything, absolutely everything, that would ever be known about the physical causes and effects of color vision. So of course, before you brought the banana in, I had already written down in exquisite detail exactly what physical impression a yellow object or a blue object would make on my nervous system. So I already knew exactly what faults I would have, because after all, the mere disposition to think about this or that is not one of your famous qualia, is it? I was not in the slightest surprised by my experience of blue. What surprised me was that you would try such a second-rate trick on me. I realize it's hard for you to imagine that I could know so much about my reactive dispositions that the way blue affected me came as no surprise. Of course, it's hard for you to imagine. It's hard for anyone to imagine the consequences of someone knowing absolutely everything physical about anything. Yeah, could Jackson, in other words, have manipulated our intuitions a little bit? Isn't it very, very hard to picture what it's like for somebody to have complete physical knowledge about a certain topic, color experience? If somebody really knows everything physical there is to know about color perception, wouldn't they be able to figure out, in this case, that the banana doesn't look the way it's supposed to? That's not yellow, it's blue. 
So wouldn't they be able to figure out ahead of time what seeing the colors should um, feel, what it should be like? I guess there's, like whenever, I guess there's, there could be a possibility that she already knows like how she's supposed to feel like after seeing a color. Like this, like, uh, like, you, like when you feel like, like you feel a certain emotion whenever you, you see yellow, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. But like, and I'm guessing, based on the way she's talking about it, I'm guessing that she already knew what she was supposed to feel like mm -hmm. seeing yellow. So I guess when she saw blue, she was confused. Yeah, there are these theories, right? Which I myself never completely understood, but about how colors are supposed to make you feel. Blue um, makes you feel peaceful, yeah. and yellow or red at any rate makes you feel excited or something. Right, remember though that it's not just feelings that get quality. Right? So it's true that in this case, since the banana is blue, she noticed that made her feel peaceful, and if it had been yellow, it was supposed to make her feel completely different. Um, just um, choose something else though, instead of yellow, make it orange. Right, that's one thing we could say. And then um, remember that we concentrate here not so much on, on what it's like to have the associated feeling as on what it's like to see the color itself. So my example from the beginning of the chapter, here's a color, that one, that I'm completely neutral to. Uh, I don't like it, I don't dislike it. There's no feeling whatsoever when I look at it, either positive or negative, no feeling. But there's still something that it's like to see that color something that it feels to see it. Not in the sense of the feeling, in the sense that that's a mode of consciousness. Does that make any sense? The way it feels to see a color, the standard phrase is the way that it's like to see a color. That need not have anything to do with feelings, emotions. Right? Could she figure out in that sense what it's like to see the colors based on her complete physical knowledge? even before she sees them. And if emotions are getting in the way here, just replace blue with something that's supposed to trigger a similar emotional response as yellow. I don't know what that is, because I don't, yeah, I don't find these theories um, particularly plausible. I think it tends to be an individual matter. Blue doesn't make me feel peaceful, nor does yellow make me feel whatever takes away. Um, could you work it out? allowed when seeing the colors in the world to monitor her own brain, to look at MRI images of her brain synchronously, right? What's going on inside her brain at that very moment. Would she be able to recognize the colors that way and figure out she's been tricked? Sure, right? Because she would notice neural patterns, which she knows based on her complete knowledge of the physical or correlated with seeing something blue rather than something yellow. Right. But even so, even if you give her access to her own neural state while looking at the object, doesn't she still learn something new about the nature of the experience? Oh, this is what it's like to see the color associated with this particular neural pattern. But she can label it correctly in that case or you know, figure out that she was tricked, but isn't there still new knowledge about quality required in the process? Does that make any sense to you? What I'm asking at least? Where does that leave us? Who's right and who's wrong? Do we have any clue? We're not talking about immaterial souls anymore. Right? So questions about you know, immortality, the afterlife, and so on, those are out the window already. This is just property dualism. And that wouldn't really guarantee any sort of immortality, um, even if it were true. But it does matter, doesn't it, whether we're fully physical, all about us, all our properties and, and states are fully physical or not. Does this thought experiment and the argument associated with it succeed in proving that consciousness is more physical. It's an 
argument designed to prove something very similar to the conclusion of the zombie argument. Feeling pain and having C5 respiring in your body can't be one and the same thing because you can conceive of one of them being present without the other. Your zombie twin would have the firing of C fibers without having uh, the associated feeling of pain. <coughs> and here, here the argument is a little different, but the conclusion is the same. The non-physical character of qualia in general, not just color qualia, what does that follow from, according to Jackson? The claim that complete knowledge about the physical aspects of the body and the brain doesn't tell you anything about quality, anything about the way that it's like to have various experiences. The conclusion is the same, but the reasoning behind it is different if you compare the zombie argument to this. Which one do you like better? Which one? The the one where Mary goes outside and then she like experiences all the colors mm -hmm. and like she well and then she either learns something new or she like she ha I don't know how to say it. like she has she, she knows what to expect I think. This one it made me like it's very like it's very hard. Like if she was like, if she's never experienced color before, mm -hmm. it'd be. I feel like it'd be hard for me if I was in that same scenario to be, for to be able to distinguish between what a color is, what color an object is supposed to have, as opposed to like mm -hmm. what it all, what mm -hmm. what color an object is supposed to have, as opposed to what it it has currently. Right, so if Mary is released into the world, but it's um, it's a world that's altered by agents in the sense that the color of the grass and the color of what she takes from the sky are inverted, right? you think that she would be able to tell that it's something funny going on. So forget about the banana, right? So in this scenario, uh, the grass that she sees actually looks blue. That's how we, we would label it, we uh, average perceivers. And the sky, or what? plays the role of this guy, looks green. Mary, in spite of her complete physical knowledge about color experiences, in your view, wouldn't be able to figure it out, wouldn't be able to tell that the colors are inverted. It shows relatively close colors, so both cool, bright blue and green, um, of that yellow and that blue. Wait, here's one more argument for you to think about, and after that, I'll let you go. You know about the knowledge argument, you know about the zombie argument in support of the same conclusion property dualism. There's also the inverted twin argument or inverted spectra. Imagine a multiple per molecule duplicate of your body and your brain. But this time it's not a, a zombie. This is not your zombie twin. It's your inverted twin. The same Chalmers, for example, uh, writes about this as well. Same philosopher by the name of David Chalmers. Physically indiscernible from you, but their experiences, their color experiences, are inverted relative to yours. When your inverted twin looks at a tomato, standard tomato, which we would all call red, they call it the same. Moreover, they instantiate the same physical property as you do when you look at that tomato. But the way their experience feels is very similar to the way in which your color experience feels when looking at broccoli and vice versa. You look at the sky, uh, they look at an orange, standard orange, and your color experience and your quality can be distinguished. You look at a tomato or you look at broccoli, they look at a tomato, your color experiences are indistinguished. Something like that is conceivable, therefore it's also possible in the sense that God could have created these creatures instead. Therefore, if physicalism is false, you can't identify seeing red with having a spiking frequency of 50 hertz in the gamma network because your inverted twin has the spiking frequency but not the experience of red. They have what we as a community would call an experience of green. Inverted spectra. You keep the physical the same, the behavior is the same, they speak just as you do, they use the same color words as you do under the same circumstances, 
but they mean something different by them because the spectrum, the color spectrum they have is inverted relative to yours. So like our blue would be their orange. Exactly, but it's more for the color. Yeah, exactly. And our red would be their green and vice versa. Another argument against physicalism. If quality are physical, if C red really were identical with having such and such a spike in frequency, it shouldn't be possible to have the spike in frequency without the experience, or to have the spike in frequency coupled with a different experience. Okay, okay thank you for your presentation.